want to thank everybody for coming out today. My name is Dana Robinson. I'm a network analyst three for the Department of Innovation and Performance. And I had the pleasure of working with this fine group here uh, from the Carnegie Mellon Heinz College. Uh, the project that they're working on was the Pittsburgh Public Wi-Fi Project. Um, what that project did was explore the feasibility of having free citywide Wi-Fi for the different neighborhoods within the city. Um, we have today, uh, who spearheaded it was Professor Sakir Yusel, sitting right there. Um, we have Lindsey Parham, we have Terry Gibbs, and we have uh, Kati Nalabolu. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna have Lindy, Lindsay come up and uh, she'll explain some things to you. Thank you so much for, for coming to view our project on the hybrid Wi-Fi framework. Um, we, thank you again to Dana Robinson. He was invaluable throughout this entire semester on helping us prepare this, this presentation. Um, as you know, we were working with the city of Pittsburgh's Department of Innovation and Performance. And they came to us at the beginning of the semester saying, we really want to look into the feasibility of municipal-wide Wi-Fi. Um, is it feasible? And if it is, what's a, the best implementation plan? Um, and so that's, we spent the entire semester um, researching and coming up with applications for the city of Pittsburgh. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about problems with the municipal Wi-Fi model. Um, then we're going to discuss our solution to those problems, our hybrid model framework. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on each of the frameworks that comprise the entire hybrid model solution, which is cost analysis, asset mapping, um, network design, and security. Then we're going to go into some of the potential issues with implementing um, this particular mo model, and then some next steps and solution, next steps and recommendations for the city. So we spent the um, the initial part of the semester um, discovering problems with municipal Wi-Fi models. So these red triangles represent all the failed municipal, large-scale municipal Wi-Fi implementations over the past 15 years. Um, what we found is, by and large, these models these Wi-Fi implementations fail, and they fail because they're usually supported by one or two initial stakeholders. Um, the demand for that is very, very low. Um, they anticipate the initial demand for a municipal or free Wi-Fi network to be about 30 to 50 percent of the population. So they anticipated 30 to 50 percent of the population would log on to this free Wi-Fi. In actuality, we discovered that about 2 to 3 percent of the population will actually log on to the Wi-Fi. The, but the cost of this municipal Wi-Fi is still the same, really, if to, regardless of whether um, you have 100,000 users or 100 users because the, the equipment costs will be the same. So the investors backed out of these municipal Wi-Fi implementations because the, the demand just was not there. Um, I'll go on to the next slide. But what we did notice was small community and neighborhood Wi-Fi models have been successful um, all over the country. And so we, we did case studies of why they were successful. And we came up with three main traits why um, three main traits of successful community implementations. So all successful community implementations have a clear objective. Um, they have appropriate demand. They've already calculated that the, de the demand will be there to support the network. And they start really small, uh, particularly in a pilot area. So a clear objective, a lot of the objectives, example objectives would be economic development or social, social good. Um, and then they determine the demand by, by a needs assessment. The demand, usually in these small community models, um, the demand drives the network. So the demand or the problem is there, and then the network acts as the solution. And then additionally, they don't start on a large scale. Um, municipal Wi-Fi networks fail because they try to cover the entire city, um, the entire city, and that's just that's too expensive. It doesn't give them, it doesn't allow for time to test or for time to do it to um, improve the network plan. So community, community networks are, are very small, and they start on a small scale. Next slide. OK, so we came up with a hybrid model, which is a, a combination of both the community networks and a, the municip municipal Wi-Fi network. It's a brand new idea that, we, that we, um, we thought of to both combine this community network, but then also the needs of the city, because the city does have an invested interest in getting Wi-Fi access across the entire across the entire um, district. So 
A community model, as I said before, is a community owned and funded Wi-Fi implementation that the city provides resources to. So the city, whatever resources the city um, has available to them, they make available to the community networks. So it's a series of small scale and neighborhood implementations that on a, combined together cover the, ma the majority of the city of Pittsburgh. So we, we decided that these, these implementation should use mesh network technology and we decided on mesh after looking carefully at multiple other other implementations mesh is great because it's affordable it's easy to use and maintain and most importantly it's scalable uh, our, our hybrid model relies on both bandwidth sharing and the traditional purchase ISP um, bandwidth sharing is like for example you have a large company and they have X amount of bandwidth that they either don't use every month or they're willing to donate to the to the network that alleviates a good deal of the cost off the network both st the initial cost and the maintaining costs okay so why this model is great for the city first I should talk about a little bit of the constraints and requirements that the city city had initially first of all the city is constrained by a very limited budget um, additionally, the city would prefer to outsource the maintenance and um, the maintenance of this network to a third party. The city was also very clear that it had to be scalable. Even if we start in a small area, we need to be able to scale this network out to reach all the all the residents. Um, security is also a very important concern. In order for the city to put its name on something, it has to have a minimum security standard. Um, also, legal. They didn't want to do anything illegal. Um, how we needed to look into <laughs> the legality of implementing a Wi-Fi system, and and it's funny to think about, but actually a good portion of our present of our our um, of our research was focused on this this particular law that that was unclear whether or not the city was even legally allowed to open up a municipal Wi-Fi um, implementation. Um, a lot of other cities get sued, and they they invest tens of millions of dollars into a network just to have incumbent ISP providers um, take them to court. So it was a, a huge consideration. Mm -hmm. So why our model fits all those requirements and constraints is the community funds this model. The community, the owners of the community network would be the primary fund, um, would provide the primary funds and finances for this model, but the city will help them identify grants and identify grants that meet their objective to offset some of the costs. Um, the maintenance of the model would also be on the, the network owners. The, the scalability, it really, we've really created a flexible framework that, that can be applied to not just one area, but the entirety of, of Pittsburgh's individual neighborhoods. The security, we've set a standard baseline security model that all networks would have to comply to if they were trying to utilize city resources. Um, and we looked into the legality of it and we, are fairly, we're really confident that we're not overstepping any federal or state laws. And also since the community would own, the community network owners would own the model, the city would not be held liable. Okay, so where community models are already working. So these are not examples of hybrid models, but they're examples of um, public access Wi-Fi throughout Pittsburgh. So it's not a big stretch to think that more communities would be interested in implementing their own Wi-Fi implementations. We have wireless Shadyside. Um, uh, all of Walnut Street is connected in Shadyside with free Wi-Fi hosted by a hotel. Um, the Downtown Pittsburgh Partnership, as you know, provides limited access Wi-Fi, and then Wireless Waterways provides wire access to access at the waterfront. Okay, so what did we deliver? We we delivered what I call a a hybrid Wi-Fi framework, and within that big framework are smaller templates and frameworks that give give you all the tools you need to create and implement a Wi-Fi model, this particular Wi-Fi wi model. Those frameworks include a needs assessment, um, asset mapping, cost analysis, network planning, security and operation standards. Um, yeah, so those are the, the individual frameworks. And during this presentation, I'm gonna talk particularly about cost analysis and asset mapping. Okay, so like I said before, a lot of a lot of um, municipal Wi-Fi networks fail because they start too large. We applied our framework to a small pilot area of East Liberty just to show that this, this is a feasible, a feasible model that can actually be applied to neighborhoods in, in Pittsburgh. So we chose East Liberty as our pilot area for, um, because it has 
a lot of ch um, economic development opportunities, particularly I think of the Target project, when I think of economic development opportunities, the city has already invested in this area, so having that, that, um, that strong pull is really great for the sustainability of a network. There's also, it's rich in resources and businesses. We looked at the City of Commerce website and there are hundreds of businesses located within East Liberty. Those businesses can act as access points for internet. So it was important that there are businesses. Um, it's a manageable size. It's about a half a square mile and it has 6,000 6, residents as well as people coming in and out to take advantage of retail and um, shopping. And then there are a lot of nonprofits and social, social groups there. So it's, um, it's, rich in, it's rich in assets and that's why we chose it as our pilot area. So asset mapping, the idea of asset mapping is identifying the, the large business stakeholders in the area, um, both large businesses, small businesses, nonprofits, and pu public services. So these green dots represent the businesses. Um, we, we used the ArcGIS and some of the GIS data from the City of Pittsburgh um, website, but then we had to add additional, additional entities onto this map, upload it, and we have identified, we've identified them here. So this is just a cutout of East Liberty. Oh, go ahead. All right, so this is, um, we took the access points, we identified these businesses, and these are the access points where we would set up mesh network, um, mesh network equipment, and the circles represent the buffer zone. And so these, um, these yellow dots here would be where we would have our internet gateways. So this is where you're getting the ISP. These are, represent large businesses that would most likely share bandwidth to this network. Um, each Small businesses and city light posts will host nodes. Those nodes will provide inter as internet access points. And um, as you can see, we're covering the majority of East Liberty up to there towards the north. Up to there towards the north is mostly residential. And because the objective of this was economic development, we were not able to cover that area with um, bandwidth shared resources. So then we talked about funding options. Funding is obviously a, a, huge, a huge component of, um, of a municipal Wi-Fi network. Um, we would work with the city to have, we worked with, with the city to identify grants and donation bases and crowdfunding sources for this network. So it wouldn't just be the community network footing the bill. They could rely on grants, donations from this, the businesses in the area. And then crowdfunding is, is a new popular way of, of getting of getting money for an initiative. We all, so we took an example, we plugged in East Liberty to our cost analysis framework and we decided that um, about, it would cost $113,000 to create a mesh network in East Liberty, 90,000 of which would be dedicated towards labor. So if the city was somehow able to offset that labor cost, it would be much more feasible to start this network at a lower, at a lower price. Okay, so some potential issues and then the next step. So the biggest issues with this particular model is incentivizing stakeholders to invest. So part of the majority of the way we get our bandwidth in order to lower the cost is by bandwidth sharing, particularly through hospitals, universities, um, big retailers like Target. They would have to share their bandwidth to offset the bandwidth cost. Um, incentivizing them to do, the, do so could be an issue. Also, we picked East Liberty because it was really rich in resources. Some areas don't have as many resources. Um, some areas are more residential. How would you kind of equalize, equalize that so they also have access to um, municipal wi or Wi-Fi? And then, of course, this model is untested, and so there's kind of the trials and tribulations that happen with an untested model. So the city of Pittsburgh's role, I talked about a little bit about what the city of Pittsburgh could do throughout this, throughout this initiative, but most, of, but most importantly, I think they need to act as a congregation point for information. There are so many rich resources out there on the web that, aren't, that could help um, each of these networks really lay out a framework for how, how they can implement and at what cost and what's worked and what hasn't worked, but it's not together in one point. So if the city could perhaps create a website that brings all those resources together, that would be the most important thing that they, they could do. As I said before, next steps, create a website, and then we've also, we've also done all the legwork for creating a, a municipal Wi-Fi implementation in East Liberty, the next step would be to actually create it by reaching out to stakeholders and gauging their interest and getting them involved. 
Um, I want to thank everyone. I would like to thank everyone for um, listening to our presentation. And again, thank you, Dana and Deborah, for all your help this semester. Can the Wi-Fi team stand up? Where are they? Right here. Any questions? Actually, maybe you explain this, but I actually am not clear on the demand side for this because with the example of the, the failed municipal mm -hmm. ones where you anticipated it was 25 to 40 percent or something like that and it actually was 2 to 3 percent, and I'm wondering whether, uh, I, I have some ideas about why that was, but, yeah. uh, but I, I'm wondering whether this is, in it, whether there actually is demand, say, in East Liberty if you looked at you know, the, the anticipated users and so forth. Uh -huh. Part of our framework is doing a needs assessment, which is one of the very first things that you should do because um, a lot of municipal Wi-Fi networks did fail because of that demand piece. A lot of the community networks, they're built because the demand already exists. Um, a lot of grassroots movements happen be organically because of the demand and the problem is already there. Um, this would just be kind of a different way of helping those networks along. And we would, we want to base these community models off of different purposes. So the demand would be based on the purpose. So if we, in Sadie's Liberty, the purpose was economic development, we would assume that the businesses would rather share their bandwidth and reduce their costs than paying for their own internet. And if it, the purpose was uh, education in a certain community, then the schools could lower their costs by doing it. I like your approach and uh, I think it has, has great merit. Have you ever thought about kind of switching the model from areas that have a relatively high demand, mm -hmm. um, like you know, areas that are developing economically, like East Liberty, for example, um, where users, there may already be a high demand, relatively high demand. Have you thought about focusing on areas where there's little or no demand, yeah. but the value could be that much more exponential in its value? Yeah, that's for that's parks, actually a, for example. That's a huge aspect of our. <laughs> <laughs> or for new communities, like or new old communities, like a community like Larmer, for example, that's adjacent yeah. to East Liberty, where you used to have sixteen thousand families there. Now you have sixteen hundred, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but the community is coming back and developing. Wouldn't it be a, a wonderful kind of driver uh, and an, an amenity to have uh, Wi-Fi for the community even before it's kind of fully formed? So that, that's actually one of the biggest hurdles from our presentation when we were dis, um, trying to decide why municipal Wi-Fi failed, was failing across the board, and we decided it was because of low demand. We had to look at why, why the demand was so low. And it was because people had a lot, the majority of people have ready access to bandwidth in their home or at work, and they also have cell phone data plans. And so we said, we decided, well, how do you, how do you then put it in an area with more demand? And people who don't have access to cell phone, to cell phone data plans and don't have municipal, or don't have um, at home Wi-Fi. So that would be um, the target, the t those areas would have the most demand. Those areas are also the poorest areas within Pittsburgh. And so if you were to put um, Wi-Fi in communities that were, had low employment rates, high high school dropout rates, single, single mother households, you would get the highest demand because they just don't have access to broadband in any other way. With the model that Working under the constraints of it has to be, um, it has to be low cost. You have to also consider, okay, consider who's going to pay for it. So in these areas where they're economically depressed, there's no one to pay for the this particular model. But then also, conversely, they have the most demand. So we're doomed. No. <laughs> and there's also an issue of whether. Uh, the people in those areas have devices to be able to use mm -hmm. the service that we would provide. Yeah, we ac we actually came up with a we came up with a map that showed these target areas where it turned out to be some of the poorest areas in Pittsburgh. But then they ha they don't have the cell phone to connect to the data, they don't ha or to the internet. They don't have the laptop to connect to the internet, and it brought up a whole other issue where you would have to get them the device to connect to your product. But there are a few programs by schools where students were given iPads as well. And we were hoping that these neighborhoods were around the yeah. economic development zone so kids can actually use their iPads at home too. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I think it's a great, I mean, your approach I think is valid. Uh, but a, the one institution that has um, kind of universal 
uh, appeal and is geographically distributed throughout, throughout the cities are parks, though. And I know there's no community there yeah. who lives in a park, but the, about 90% of the people in the city of Pittsburgh use parks. Um, over the course of a year or th you know a few months, and it might be a, an interesting point uh, to think about that as almost a public utility, um, because it, it's becoming that way. If it's not already, mm -hmm. we're not already there yet. Do we have the data on cell phone or uh, uh, portable device uh, ownership? Unfortunately, we don't. So how we calculated that was we had to take a national statistic mm -hmm. and then apply that to the demographics that we have on Pittsburgh. So right. like. Um, age and income demographics and we had to match that with the national usage because it, it does seem there is a sweet spot for need which is actually communities that actually have the portable devices mm -hmm. but in fact you know but are operating them on the type of plans that don't have a cellular data plan and i think that and that that's where there's sort of like there's no opportunity to get to the actual to the internet without a broadband you know without this kind of wi-fi thing or you know or the or, or a business that has it and so and that seems like where you'd have a really intense kind of demand. So uh, can we target those? Um, our biggest on, our biggest constraint was both the we had to come up with a model that took into consideration also the financial constraint. Yeah. So this hybrid model is a is a reflection of that right. finding ways for other for communities to pay for it and right. and if it's a community that um, so we would have to almost redo redo our thinking if those funds became available. Can I ask another question? Have we mapped, is it, do we, can we, do we map cellular phone, cellular phone usage in the city? That will be our next capstone. <laughs> an excellent, yeah, because that's, that's also sometimes used as an indicator for certain types of uh, innovative neighborhoods, et cetera. So mm -hmm. anyhow, thank you. Any other questions?